first try because it's only about one or two pages, uh, but it's near the book of Jonah there. Um, and uh, Anyway, it's good to be in the pulpit. Next Sunday, I will be gone. Uh, we have a family wedding. Uh, my nephew, who took after his dad's side and stands about six feet, seven inches tall. My mom is five feet tall even. I love seeing a picture of the two of them, uh, grandmother and grandson side by side. He's getting married in uh, Gastonia, North Carolina, so we're going to be down there next weekend. It's actually a Sunday wedding, uh, Sunday afternoon. But you have a real blessing next week. Um, uh, John Marks, uh, M-A-R-K-S, he retired uh, from the ministry recently, lives in Pamplin, Virginia, and is a former president uh, for two years. They go in two-year cycles in the early 2000s of our entire state convention, and a gifted speaker and just a wonderful man of God, and he'll be filling in the pulpit next week, so it'll be in great hands, and so I hope that you can uh, make it. Uh, next week. We're going to be looking in just a moment at Obadiah beginning in verse 10. Notice I don't say chapter and verse because they're not multiple chapters. Chapters, It's just verse 10. But as you are turning there, you know recently Karen and I have noticed uh, foxes in and around our property and uh, it's a beautiful thing to see. They're actually little kits. So um, uh, a couple of mornings in the past few weeks, I have seen one of them right on the bank uh, where you turn into our driveway almost like a sentry guarding uh, our house. Uh, a week or two ago, I saw one of them that had a squirrel in its mouth, and they've really been beneficial in helping reduce our squirrel population, which you know I'm not fond of, of squirrels. But they're really enjoyable to watch. They are a mess. You do have to sweep up after them, especially the parking lot and over there in front of the uh, focus center. But I love watching them. They're a curiosity to me. Um, bears, not so much, though. Uh, I'll be honest. Um, I respect bears. Uh, I have been given instruction of what to do. I think the latest instruction is if you come across a bear, just make yourself as big as you can and scream and try to intimidate them. To me, it's counterintuitive. Why would a larger animal be scared of a crazy person just <laughs> screaming? But I had a good friend that I, he's still a good friend. I just not seen him recently. Fred Richmond lives over in Cumberland County. He used to make walking sticks and I bought one of his walking sticks. So I carry it with me when I go across uh, the road there uh, at night. But you know, it's one thing that's true about bears that we've all heard. You're in dangerous territory if you come between a bear and its cubs. You better back out. I know that. Get out of the way of it. You know, today we're looking again in the book of Obadiah. God's precious possession was Israel. And we see a nation, Edom, that was coming between God and Israel. In fact, we see God was working out his sovereign plan of chastising his people. He was going to bring his people back into the land some 70 years later. But here are the Edomites and they're working against Israel they are mocking Israel. We're, they're, they're trying to, to frustrate Israel and hinder Israel at every turn. And so today we're going to begin our study anew uh, in Obadiah verse 10. And he's speaking to Edom and God says, You will be covered with shame and destroyed forever because of violence done to your brother Jacob, that is Israel. On the day you stood aloof, on the day strangers captured his wealth, while foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. Do not gloat over your brother. Remember we said that there was a connection between Jacob and Esau. Israel came from Jacob, Edom. Uh, came from Esau. And so there was a close relation. Do not gloat over your brother uh, Israel in the day of his calamity. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah, which is the southern kingdom of Israel, in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. In other words, he's saying, don't loot the city there. 
Yes, you do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster and do not appropriate their possessions in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the crossroads as they're fleeing to cut off their fugitives. Do not hand over their survivors in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near against all nations as you have done, so it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your own head. As you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and gulp down and be as though they had never been. But there will be a deliverance on Mount Zion, and it will be holy. The house of Jacob will dispossess those who dispossess them. Then the house of Jacob will be a blazing fire and the house of Joseph a burning flame. But the house of Esau will be stubble. Jacob will set them on fire. Again, Jacob is Israel and consume Edom. There'll be no survivor to remain of the house of Esau for the Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will possess the hill country of Esau. Those from the Judean foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will possess the territory of Ephraim and Samaria, while Benjamin will possess Gilead. The exiles of the Israelites are in Hala and who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, as well as the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad will possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau, but the kingdom will be the Lord's. Let's pray. Father, as we close this brief two-week study in Obadiah, we acknowledge today and as we read the word that you're sovereign over all things. Father, sometimes in our lives, things may seem to be in disarray or, or uh, not in right order. But God, you're working. Father, we acknowledge today that history is moving in a line. That God, you are bringing this world toward its climax. And the Lord, that will be when Jesus Christ returns. I pray within the sound of my voice that every person who is here today would be ready for that day. That every person has acknowledged his or her sin, repented of it, and believed in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Again, we're in our second study, and if you were with us uh, last week, you noticed with me that Obadiah is actually uh, the smallest book in the Old Testament. It's only 21 verses, but there's a lot really that's packed into this uh, tiny book. And the, the bulk of the prophecy and the sole bulk of the prophecy really rests toward Edom. Last week we saw that Edom had its splintered reeds. Those were the things that Edom was leaning on uh, in order to prop itself up. And, and God was saying uh, through Obadiah, they're splintered reeds. You lean on them, but they're going to flail. You lean on them, but they're going to give way. It's like leaning on wet spaghetti. In fact, it's even worse than that because spaghetti just gives way. But these splintered reeds, they'll give way and they'll actually hurt you and splinter you uh, on the way down. We talked about how Edom was trusting in its location. It was located in a, a, a mountainous terrain. They could hide in the cleft of the rock and they felt they were impenetrable. We talked about how they trusted in uh, their allies, but how God says that those who eat at your table are actually going to turn against you. They trusted in their wise people. We talked about how um, Eliphaz, one of Job's advisors in the book of Job, came from this particular territory. It was a place that was famous for its wisdom, but God says its wisdom would be taken away from it. And he said, and your military leaders will cower. And so we saw last week in the first nine verses that Edom was not right with God. Edom was not depending on God, but we're going to see today even more than that. Edom was in rebellion against God. Edom would be judged because it would not acknowledge God nor God's people there. Edom was at enmity with Israel. 
You know, we talked about Jacob and Esau, and whenever we see Jacob in this context, it speaks of Israel. And we all, many of us remember the story of Jacob and Esau and how through deception, Jacob was able to gain the birthright and the blessing and the higher position of the two, even though Esau was older, how Jacob was returning to the land. He was fearful of Esau, but Esau himself was a vain man and to blame uh, for giving away um, his birthright, uh, nonetheless, became forgiving toward his brother. You, you may remember, I, I'm glad I, I wasn't uh, uh, living in that day, and, I, and I'm definitely glad that I wasn't one of uh, Jacob's lesser loved wives, because you remember when he came, he put the ones he didn't like as much out front, thinking, I'll save the one that I like the most, Rachel. But Esau forgave him. And it was a beautiful picture of forgiveness. But the problem was this. Esau's descendants did not follow suit. Edom, those who descended from Esau, was anti-Israel. And at seasons we see here, Edom was antagonistic toward Israel, and at other times when Israel was struggling, it's almost like they sat back with their arms folded and enjoyed the, the situation of difficulty that Israel was in. But this was a major problem for Edom because God cared about the nation of Israel. Israel is God's prized possession. Among all of the nations God could have chosen, he chose to work through Israel in the book of Romans chapter 9 and verse 4 in the New Testament. Paul speaks of Israel and its favor. He writes, to Israel belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. And he continues in Romans chapter 9 and verse 5, the ancestors are theirs, and from them by physical descent, came the Messiah, who is God over all, praise forever and ever. Amen. Paul, uh, many years after this, in the New Testament times, in the time of the early church, was saying this, Israel is a prized possession of God. He didn't just give the, the law through Moses to any nation. He gave them to Israel. And by the way, he said, our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, came from this nation. And so in the past two weeks, as we've been looking at Obadiah, we've seen the sin last week that they were really leaning on things they shouldn't have been leaning on. They were not trusting God. But then this week, we see that they're turning against God's people. And, and he adds to that, as we see in verse 15 through 17, that there's coming a day. There's coming a day of accountability not just for Edom, but he says for all nations, which includes us. Do you realize there's coming a day of judgment? There's coming a day when every one of us, whether it be as a nation or an individual, will stand before God. But then finally, and as he closes this book, we see the favor and the restoration that he promises to Israel. Well, let's first look at this further sin of Edom its antagonism and at times indifference toward Israel. And like I said, last week we looked at the wrong things upon which they le leaned and all of those would give way. But there was another problem here with Edom. You see, Israel was called the pupil of God's eye or the apple of God's eye in Zechariah chapter 2 in verse 8. That meant Israel was special to God. And it doesn't take much to see that Edom is in total contradiction to God. Look at what it says in verse 10. You will be covered with shame, Edom, and destroyed forever. Why is that? Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob. Again, Israel, they were the descendants of Jacob. And so it was because of the violence toward Israel. And then in verse 11, we see not just their antagonism, but at times their indifference. You stood aloof 
on the day strangers captured his wealth. We talked last week, time-wise, this is in all likelihood written right after the time that Judah was exiled to Babylon. In Daniel, in our study today, uh, uh, in Sunday school, we're looking how God is moving to begin to replace uh, Babylon. There was going to become the Medo-Persian Empire. Cyrus was going to allow the people of Judah to come back after 70 years. But this is on the near the front end of it. And so while Judah was being judged, Edom was certainly not offering a helping hand. In fact, he says, uh, on the day strangers captured his wealth, while, while fa foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. You were co-conspirators. He says, do not gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. He gave this command. Why? Because their propensity was to rejoice over uh, the, the destruction of uh, the people of God, Judah. And then in verse 13, do not enter the gate of my people. Why did he say that? Because their leaning was toward this. Uh, now that they are defeated, we're going to go into the gates and we're going to loot the place. And God says, don't do it. And then not only that, in verse 14, he said, don't stand at the crossroads. Edom uh, was south of, of Judah. And, and he's saying, don't hinder its flight. Don't keep it. Don't work against it and work for uh, the Babylonians. Don't stand at the crossroads and keep them uh, from seeking the protection that they would do. Why is God saying all of this? Because Edom despised Israel. Now, this prophecy was given in 587 B.C., right around in there. But the animosity went years before that. In fact, you could go about 1,000 years back and see it was worse than the Hatfields and the McCoys time-wise. That the Edomites despised the Israelites. Not so much the Israelites, the Edomites, but the Edomites despised them. In fact, in the day of Moses, as the people were trying to make their way to the promised land, we read in Numbers chapter 20, Israel said, we're gonna, can we go through your land? We'll take care of it. We'll replace anything. We'll make sure nothing's harmed. What did Edom say? No, you're not going to do it. And so they stood against them. In the day of King Jehoshaphat, and we studied this last year on, on Wednesdays when we were going through the Old Testament kings, there were the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites, all that were down south and east of, of the people of Judah that were standing against them, and they were antagonistic toward them in that season. So see, at first they were indifferent in Moses' day, then they're antagonistic, and Jehoshaphat is praying to God, and he said, isn't this the people group? that we were kind toward in our history, yet they're returning kindness with evil. That was about 300 years prior to this. And so now, after Israel's exile, we see we go to the day of Moses. They were indifferent and not helpful. In the day of Jehoshaphat, some 500 years after that, they were antagonistic. And now in 587 B.C., they're both. And so for about a 1,000 years... Edom was against Israel. You know what Edom was guilty of? Transgenerational sin. Not just one generation. Shame on the fathers and mothers of Edom who taught their children to hate the people of God. And what a shame is it today when families hold resentment toward people because of who they are, where they were born, what they're doing. There are many people today who are guilty of this sin, transgenerational sin, passing on the sin from the fathers to the children, despising families, despising people of a different race, despising neighbors, people not allowing their children to speak to other children. I could hear what was happening in that day as it would go down from generation to generation and the Edomites would say, we just don't hang with them. We don't like them. 
Do you know what they did to us? Do you realize that they think they're better than us and so we're not going to associate with them? You see what they were doing? They were holding the sin of Jacob. And even though God favored Jacob, Jacob was not perfect. They were holding the offense of the forefather against that generation. There are many families that are in conflict today because they've not stopped the pain. They've not taken the step to make right what needs to be made right. And you know the problem is the children learn and it perpetuates. Edom was guilty of transgenerational sin. But add to that, they had no regard for God. There are many families today, and it is sad, they have no fear for God. They don't know God. They won't follow God. They don't choose God. And guess what? The children are raised in the same situation. And by, by the grace of God that a friend would invite, that someone else would invite, that child may never have the privilege of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're responsible to set the example for our children. We're responsible to pray for our children and to break transgenerational sin. But I want you to see a second truth, God's judgment of the nations. Look at verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near. So he's saying, okay, Edom, the day of the Lord is near. Now that's a familiar term to us if you've been with us the last few weeks in the book of Malachi, a prophecy to Judah, God's people. God was speaking about the day of the Lord and we talked about that day of the Lord was a day everyone understood to be when the Lord would appear, when the Lord would act, when the Lord would bring retribution against those who have worked against him, and when God, when God would show favor to his own people. The arrival of the Messiah, the people in the Old Testament were looking forward to that. They misunderstood everything Jesus uh, was going to do. They truncated what he actually was going to do, but they did understand and were looking for him. And so now we see to an ungodly nation the same thing is said. Now, here are two different books one spoken to the people of God, one spoken to a nation that's against the people of God, and a common theme the day of the Lord. I don't know about you, but when I see a common theme, that sort of puts the exclamation point on it that this is really going to happen. And he says that the day of the Lord is coming, and, and as you have done, it will be done. To you. And so the first thing we see, it's going to be a day of retribution for those who set themselves against God. And Edom happened to be one of those nations. Notice there again in verse 15, as you've done, it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your head. If you're set against God, if you choose a life apart from God, if you're against the things that matter to God, then you're going to receive the result of that. As you've drunk on my holy mountain, uh, we looked at an emperor today that was partying it up and using even God's utensils to do it. He said, all the nations will drink continually. They'll drink and gulp down and be as if they'd never been. They'll be judged. It'll be a day of retribution. What is true for nations like Edom is also true for people today. If you live your life with no regard for God, if you reject his son, Jesus Christ, you're no different from Edom. Do you realize that, that a person who has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ is actually at this very moment at enmity against God? You may say, well, that person seems to be a pretty good person. That person may not be the worst person I've seen. Well, the scripture says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, what would you do with if at that time when you were what? Enemies of Christ. He's speaking to the time before one believes in Jesus Christ. You see, one of the attributes of Edom here was it was indifferent to what mattered to God. And the person who rejects Jesus Christ, whether through active rebellion or indifference, is set as an enemy against God and will receive retribution for his or her acts in that coming day. So what do you need to do today? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
trust him as your Lord and Savior. Because we see it's also going to be that day, a day of justice for God's people. Look at verse 17. While there'll be judgment on the nations and they'll be as if they had never been, verse 17, but there will be deliverance on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is another term for Jerusalem, the capital city of Judah, the southern kingdom, part of Israel. There's going to be a deliverance. In our study in Malachi, just about three or four weeks ago, you may remember that part of the day of the Lord, there's going to be a dividing of the righteous and the unrighteous. There's going to be a dividing in that day. Malachi 4 and verse 3 said, not just that, uh, that uh, God's people would be favored, but they would trample as ashes under the feet those who were set against them. I wonder today, are you a part of God's family? Are you God's possession? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you ready for that day? Well, I want to look at God's future plan for his nation, Israel. And this is important for us to understand. But the first thing I want you to know is that if you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be family. You'll be part of the family of God. You will be a child of God. Years ago, a political official was at Liberty University, and he misstated. And I appreciate old man Jerry Falwell, who's passed away. This political official said, we're all God's children. And then when uh, uh, Mr. Falwell stood up, he said, uh, with all due respect, we're not all God's children. But as many as received Jesus, to them gave he the right to be called children of God. There's so many metaphors, there's so many pictures of what it means to belong to God. You can belong to God today if you would believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the other pictures of that is you become the bride of Christ. Aren't you glad if you've trusted in Christ that God loves you, that God has a plan for you in spite of your imperfections, that his love for you is is not affected by time. It's an eternal love. It's not affected by performance. It is unconditional. I don't know what you're going through today. It may be adversity. It may be the world is set against you, but I promise you, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's with you. He won't leave you. But do you realize that there's also a nation God loves? You know, sometimes we try to just put God in a box and we say, well, Israel messed up. God's done with Israel. He's moving on with the church and the church is taking the place. Don't get me wrong with all due respect to the church. And, and it should be respected because it is the bride of Christ. The way I understand scripture is there's a remnant too of Israel. Now we need to understand that this remnant of Israel is not going to be accepted just because it's born of the nation of Israel. But that remnant, it is clear, the scripture teaches that there's going to be a turning back to Jesus Christ. You may have heard the term Messianic Jews. These are Jews who believe in the true Messiah. And the way I read scripture, I understand that God still, while he's working with the church, you know God can multitask. He's also working with this nation. Paul says when he's talking to the Gentile believers in Romans, he said, who, who were beginning to be prideful and looking down on Israel who had its sins, as many of us do. But he said, you, though a wild olive branch, were grafted back. And they were broken off because of unbelief. If they would believe, cannot God graft back in the cultivated, the natural branch? as easily or more easily than the wild branch. That branch, Paul clearly helps us understand as Israel. It's not perfect, but it's preserved. I don't know many Ammonites or Edomites today. I haven't heard anybody say, hey, I'm an Edomite. I'm a Moabite. But I've heard somebody say, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. In the book of Revelation, we read of the 12 tribes of 12,000. In Daniel chapter 9, there's a future prophecy. God says it's about, Daniel, your people, Daniel. In Revelation, as we know it, uh, Jerusalem's going to be a central plot, place. What did God say? That, that's Israel's land. What did he, he told David? That, that David would rule from there. And we know that the descendant of David, both the root and the branch of David, Jesus Christ, will be ruling from the holy city. 
So here we see that God is speaking. And in verse 18, he says, the house of Jacob will be a blazing fire. It will no longer be destroyed. It will be the destroyer. But the house of Esau will be stubble. Jacob will set them on fire and consume them. And then he moves on in verses 19. People from the Negev will possess the hill country of Esau. Esau, we notice, is located uh, below to the south of, of the, the, the promised land there. And the people of the Negev would be the Jews would do that. Those from the Judean foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. What is that? The western land r right along the sea. And they will possess the territories of Ephraim and Samaria. Area. Those are the northern and the central areas. While Benjamin will possess Gilead. Gilead, the two and a half tribes, were given Transjordan. What is God saying? As far south as God is determined, as far west as God is determined, the central and the north and the east, what does he say? They're going to be God's people, the Israelites. He's going to remove the squatters. You know, there are a lot of people today that I understand from reading the news. They just show up and live in places and act as if it's theirs. They're not paying rent on it. And sometimes it takes a real act to get people, squatters, out of a place that doesn't belong to them. God's going to remove the nations that think that that territory is theirs and replace them as he wants it to be. Do you realize that the remnant of Israel... And those of us who trust in Christ, we're going to be elevated that day under rulers, under the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, saviors will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau, but the kingdom will be the Lord's. It's like in Caesar's empire. Caesar had under rulers, those that were given certain authority. But when Paul appealed to Caesar, Caesar was that ultimate authority. God is, is authority over all of the kingdom. He will grant those of us who have believed in him responsibility. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians 6, when the church was in conflict, somebody was going to take somebody to court, he says, don't you understand that you'll rule, that you'll do that? Why do you take it to unbelievers? Well, as we close today, I'm not a, of Jewish origin. Probably many of you aren't. So you might say, what about me? This prophecy is a prophecy given uh, against Edom, and we would say for Israel. Well, praise God, we serve a big God. And God loves the church. And God sent a Messiah through Israel, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the promised Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the ages, and he is the one you need to know. And the scripture says that people of any and every nation who would believe in him would become a part of the family of God. When call, God called Abraham out of a pagan people, he says, I'm going to bless the nations through you. And Jesus came from Abraham of physical descent, and he's the savior of the world. God has a plan for you. Just as he had a plan for Edom, that it would not survive. Just as he has a plan for Israel, that that remnant will, will somehow make it through time. God said in, uh, in Isaiah, I think it's around 46, verses, not verse 9 or verse 11. He says, I call a bird of prey. He was talking about King Cyrus to bring these people back into the land. If he can call a pagan king, he can call a nation that he had early called to repentance and he can call you and me to repentance don't reject his son today when you stand before God one day he's not going to say what family were you born to even even with the Jews he's not going to say were you born a Jew you're okay no it's one who's circumcised in the heart when you stand before God one day he's going to say what did you do with Jesus have you believed in him have you given your life to him? I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer it. So as we look at Obadiah today, we see that that coming day of the Lord is going to be a day of retribution for those who have set themselves against God. But for those of us in this day who have trusted in God, 
It will be a day of deliverance. And what a day that'll be. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, I admit to you we don't understand all of your sovereign plan. But God, we know that you love us. We know that you speak your word into our hearts. And there's some here today, they might say, well, I'm not like Edom. I haven't set myself against God and his plan. But Lord, to be honest, they've been indifferent to your Lord, Jesus Christ, over our lives. They've not made him Lord. For some, they've lived their lives with no acknowledgement of him. Some today, Lord, maybe there's some that would honestly say, God, I've been resisting you. I've not been conforming to your will. I've been standing at the crossroads working against you. Lord, I pray you would convict hearts today. Because, Lord, when that day comes, it doesn't matter how many possessions we have, how many good deeds we have done. It doesn't matter what family we were born into. But it matters, Lord, have we trusted in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray today we do that. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're getting ready to sing in just a moment. As we close, I heard God's word from a young age.